Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's session where we are joined by Dr. Jonathan Katz from Your Performance in Mind. And during this session, what we'll do is we'll explore the notion of self-care for coaches uh, and specifically exploring resilience, stress, mood and well-being uh, and look at it and view it through a coach's lens. And so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jonathan. Thank, thanks, Dusty. Well, well, welcome, folks, to our, our, our conversation today. And to, to, to reinforce the message, it's looking at um, coach self-care. And it's the, the importance is that as, as, as coaches are involved with um, managing a number of demands and pressures and interactions, often coaches place themselves at the end of their need to support list. And uh, this, this talk is around trying to, to change that and bring awareness into not just the importance of coach self-care, but, but more importantly, the how to. So, so, so that's where, where, where we are for, for today. One of the key, one of the key, key things in self care is actually to understand the, the, the demands that people are facing and the landscape that they're working in. And although this may sound like an obvious statement, it's, it's often people know it intellectually, but they don't necessarily appreciate it in, in relation to how that information is actually helpful in how they manage themselves. So you, you can you can see on, on this particular graphic that there, there, there are three interrelated areas in, in, in the Venn diagram. And, it, and it's represented in, in this way because these can be areas where a coach might have specific difficulties um, in, in one aspect or one of the areas. But, but importantly, that they, they, they can interact. So how, how a coach may feel on the inside may interact with how they relate with people around them as, as they're going about their coaching duties. The intrapersonal area refers to the internal psychological and emotional experience the, the, the coach feels on, on, on the inside. The interpersonal factors, the bottom left, refer to the, the external interactions and the transactions that a coach has um, with the people that they're involved with, be they the people they're coaching, be that if they're coaching young people, they're the parents and, and others. And, and finally, there's, there's our environmental considerations or the organizational factors. And I'm going to take a moment to talk about these a little bit further in, in turn. The, the intrapersonal um, aspects is, is really important because the main areas that we're looking at developing resilience in for coaches is in how we feel in ourselves. And, and this links to the managing of stress, um, as, you, as you can see on the slide, managing the pressures, the expectations we have, perhaps the expectations we perceive others to have of us, and, and the demands that we face. And there are also some, some personal aspects around this, and these link to the sort of the personal professional boundaries, the, 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 the work-life balance, so, so to speak. The, the interpersonal factors, as you can see here, as I mentioned before, relate to the communication with others. And, and you can see a, a, a list here of various um, interpersonal interactions which occur. And the types of interactions will vary depending on the type of coaching that someone is doing. 
and it's important to to, to note that an, a number of coaches may work in in a, in a range of different settings. Uh, an example being a, a coach may work in in schools or work with young people in the school context. They they may have their various clubs in which they coach, and and they also may work in or around national squads and national camps. And each of those three areas have their own subset of stakeholders. And if there's one coach in those three broad areas, the number of stakeholders it, it does, does expand exponentially. And, and, the, and the, the final area of, of that diagram is, is the organizational elements of that. And this lead, this follows on from the interpersonal elements in 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 that there are single and multiple coaching settings that I've mentioned. Additionally, the governing body has its own requirements for for what a coach needs needs to do. If if a coach is working in the elite high performance space, then there are the demands of of that space and if that is at, at, at competitions abroad then then that brings a whole array around clarity sorry around the transport and and navigating international stakeholders as well as the the um domestic ones which you've mentioned and and finally one that i think is really important and that's to do with role and you can see here a number of challenges that, that some coaches may face, specifically role clarity, being asked to, to provide some coaching re work without necessarily knowing precisely what the terms and conditions are of, of that in terms of delivery alongside any of the organizational, the financial um, aspects of a given role. There can be role confusion, and this is the reverse, if you like, of role clarity and the demands of delivering where you're not sure what you're doing, but, but more importantly, or as importantly, it may be that as a coach, your understanding of what you're doing is clear to you, but the people around you have a different understanding of what they think your role should be. So there can be role confusion in those terms. There can be role conflict. A very practical example of, of that is, is, is where you have the, the same time that is wanted for two or three different areas that, that, that you're coaching. An example I, I experienced recently, I was present at, at a British fencing camp that same weekend there was a coach development day being delivered by one of the regions and ideally i would have preferred to have done both um i, I made a choice and i did one recognizing that that, that there was that conflict um, ambiguity is is not knowing and and i've mentioned there are multiple roles so, so what you can see on 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 at this point is there are a, ray, a range of demands. Some come from within, some come from the relationships that I'm, I'm involved with as a coach, and some come from the organizational demands of, of, of the various roles that I undertake. And oftentimes there may be an interaction between these, these, these areas. Move move on now to look at and understand some of the ideas ar around re resilience. R resilience is is a is is a widely used and quoted uh, concept, and with its wide array of use, there can be a number of different interpretations or understanding. Of, of what resilience is. So part of what we'll talk about in a moment is around 
getting some clarity for for our conversation to, to today. What is fairly universally held is the idea that the, there's a strong relationship between resilience and well-being, and that's psychological well-being. And the, the, the key aspect or area in which resilience is, is best experienced, it's in the quality of coping and well-being. The, the, and we'll talk about how the quality of things as well as the content of things as, as we progress a bit later. This is, this, this is a graphic that is one way to summarize developing resilience. And for, for me, I, I, I like this concept because it's very portable and it cuts through the array of literature and different opinions and provides what I feel is some, some, some clarity. What is important is it's built on the notion that resilience is a skill or a set of skills as people that we, we can learn. In, in other words, it's not something someone is either born with or, or not. It is something that can be acquired. And, and that's really important. And I think very much a hopeful, empowering notion. And the resilience is something because it can be achieved or maintained and supported. One of the key areas to understand how a given coach needs to develop resilience for themselves is to understand the specific demands and pressures that they're facing, which is why we spent a bit of time earlier beginning to identify what those look like. And as you can see on the slide, re resilience is where there is a degree of balance whereby the coach has, or importantly, they perceive themselves to have the sufficient resources to manage the demands that they're facing. And bearing in mind, those demands can come externally, can come from one's own expectations, and can come from the environment. So, so this balance is, is, is really one of the ways to, to, to identify when does someone have, in quotes, sufficient resilience at a given point in time. In the literature, when, when resilience is spoken about, it's often spoken about in, in strong association with, with stress or the stress experience. And as much as there is written about resilience, there is even more written about and spoken about in, in stress. So where, where we're going next is to to talk a little bit about the stress process. And you can see that in the title of the slide and that this slide will form a, an, a, an overview for, for the, the, uh, the rest of our conversation. And we'll go th and we'll use this information and focus on aspects of that in greater depth. So you can see on this slide, there is an overview. And the, the, I want you to direct your attention first to the blue squares with the white text. And, and you can see there are three broad areas and you can see there are arrows. The three broad areas are identifying that there is an interaction or a transaction between the, the person and the, and the environment within which they're located. So if, for example, I, I'm working as a coach 
and and I am running 15 minute typical club based individual lessons and I'm there for two hours that, that gives me if my arithmetic is correct eight eight 15 minute slots but there are 12 people in the group so I I, I have a mismatch between time resource and, and the external demand. So that's an example of the external and the internal working in by way of an interaction. I'd, I'd like to draw your attention now to the white rectangles with the, with the black text. You, you can see that there are the sources or the triggers come from the external situations and or interactions or a combination. Those situations or those interactions are perceived by the individual as the trigger or as a trigger. It, it triggers a, a thought process and or an emotional process or a combination of the two. It raises questions around what does it, what is, what does this situation mean? So, for example, in when I spoke about having to have 12 lessons in the time for eight, the appraisal is, will four people miss out? Do I shorten the length of lessons? So I, I, I'm relieved that everyone gets a lesson, but I may be conscious that that people are not getting what they would ideally need or want because they're getting less time. So there's an appraisal aspect. And there may even be a physiological reaction. I may, I may feel physically tense, for example, in, in that moment, that internal experience. And then I may, I may feel anxious. I may feel frustrated, for, for example. I'm, 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 I may, I may actually feel quite satisfied because I recognize that my solution to shorten the lesson time, but cater to all the fences is an equitable way forwards. So that's an example of a behavioral response is, is the, is actually implementing the example of equitable time. The, the, the two key points I'd, I'd like to highlight here moving forwards is that how we feel emotionally, the emotional consequences is a consequence to how I as a coach perceive and appraise the experience I'm in. So those are consequences and we'll talk in more detail about what they look like. And I want to reinforce a point I made a little earlier and, and to use this as a bit of a mental map, this graph is a mental map to locate different elements that we talk about as, as we go forwards. Can I just check, Dusty? Is, it, is there any, are there any points of, any questions or points of clarification at this stage? Or, or should I call am I good to continue? Uh, there's none at this moment, but it'd be really great to hear what people are thinking and also if you do have any questions. So uh, it's a good prompt, Joe. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. In the previous in the previous slide, I spoke about. Sorry, in this slide, I, I spoke about the internal experience. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that as, as we speak now. Under pressure, people tend to have typical, typical pot, uh, patterns of how they respond to the situation that they find themselves in. And for the moment, I'd like you to consider situations as a coach that, that you may find negative or uncomfortable. So a particular subset, if you like. Of, of situations that we we may experience. And, and these patterns, when they are activated or triggered, they can they can activate or trigger various kinds of internal processes, which I'm calling, which are called stress drivers. That's the title of this slide. 
and, and you can see here on this slide five typical groups or types of stress drivers that people can experience and at a given and, at a, and in a given experience or in a given situation one of these may be the predominant one someone experiences it is also possible that people may experience two or more of, of them so i'm going to take a moment to briefly describe what these stress driver labels refer to <clears throat> the the be perfect driver is is summarized by the idea that everything i do must be perfect the first time every time and that standard is uh, is also used to match other people's behavior towards me so things must be perfect all the time the first time every time and we'll talk about the consequences of these a bit later there's a be strong driver which is some people feel that asking for support or help is a weakness so under negatively stressful circumstances a person with a be strong driver may tend to withdraw and seek to cope exclusively on their own and as things become increasingly more difficult the more they withdraw and that withdrawal may be not necessarily physically withdrawal but it may be psychologically and emotionally withdrawal another stress driver as you can see is the try harder and the, the try harder is where the person feels for things to be good they must put their maximum effort into everything they do so if for example as a, as a coach i coach people who are um, novice fencers and i coach people who are on the, going to say junior world cup events the try harder driver which says i need to put as much effort into every detail in the novice fences lesson as i would with the world the junior world cup fences lesson even though the novice may not require all of that additional effort to get what is optimum for them so the try harder is indiscriminate in this regard the hurry up driver is is one where the coach feels that they're chasing and they, they're working on one thing and whilst they're doing one thing they're thinking about the thing they need to do and then planning the thing they need to do after that and then also worrying about what's going to follow so their mind is continually time traveling from where they are to where they need to be and so, so there's very, very, so there's very little time do they spend being present in the current moment. The please people driver is one of seeking and needing the approval of others for the coach to feel good about themselves. So often, uh, a please people sort of pattern would look like somebody seeking lots of reassurance even, even though they may be quite capable of doing the activity there's a, there's a level of insecurity which suggests i'm only okay if people whose opinion i value tell me i'm okay so they're often motivated by seeking approval and one of the challenges as a coach in this regard is if as a coach someone is seeking approval and you're working with someone whose way whose way of training is not being particularly productive there may be some difficult conversations that are required which where a coach may need to question or challenge and in questioning or challenge the coach may risk be having the pupil sort of 
not like what they what they're being told, so there may be a risk of disapproval. So you can you can perhaps see in that scenario how a please people driver can be counterproductive when it comes to certain kinds of training. I, I, I've, I've spoken quite a lot around the drivers. I've spoken uh, around the internal processes. And where we're going to go next is, is, is a deeper dive to elaborate why certain drivers are are unhelpful and then we'll, we'll move on to okay so what do we do about it and the the term I'm, I'm going to use quite a lot going forwards is self-talk or an internal dialogue and by way of um, confirmation for some and perhaps clarity for others uh, the internal dialogue or self-talk, both terms mean the same. It's the content of the internal conversation a coach has with themselves about themselves in how they're going about doing their coaching duties. So it's an internal process. And, and uh, and I'm going to, and this is uh, so this this slide is a, is a summary of what I've just said in looking at the implications of how I talk to myself. On this slide, you you can see a, 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 a double sided arrow with more helpful and positive on one side and negative and less helpful on the other. I'm presenting this slide here, or the, the, this, uh, these concepts here, because they're used frequently. Certainly the phrase, be more positive, be, le be less negative, etc. And the, the two-sided arrow is really important by way of consequence. And it's as follows. How I hear a lot of conversation from people is that they talk about that was a really good fight or a bad fight or that was a good lesson or a bad lesson the way of phrasing things is binary and so it's a, which, which leaves the option of, of it either being completely great or completely rubbish so there's quite a potential emotional swing if you remember that emotions are consequent to the thinking. The arrow here is more of a continuum. It represents degrees of experience. So things could be a little bit negative, like very, very negative, and similarly can be okay or really very positive. And I'm using the words positive and negative to relate to how the experience feels for the person on the inside and the and the concept of helpful i'm going to define this way for a way of thinking to be helpful is that the thinking helps the person achieve what it is they would like to achieve so it is goal directed if you like or expectation director or expectation informed so when I say in, in, in this information, in the, in the presentation, something is less helpful, the thought process is moving the person away from where they would prefer to be. So, so building on that, you could, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm looking to here, I'm going to define the characteristics of what less helpful thinking is. The content of less helpful thinking is that it's inflexible. It's categorical or, or binary, as I mentioned before. It's absolute standards. It must be 100% this or it's 100% that. And there's a very intolerance 
or people being intolerant of difference. So it's so in a conversation, if there's a different opinion, it's not that somebody has an equally valid but different opinion. Their opinion is wrong because mine is right, and it, and I and I will not tolerate or accept that opinion. And and consider the number of stakeholders as coaches we come across and the variety of opinions there are. And if I hold an intolerance of different kind of style of self-talk, all of those conversations are potential triggers for negative stress. And those consequences are, are, are manifest through these mental filters in the way we described earlier. The more helpful style or type of thinking is the kind of thinking is more flexible. It's there's, there are ways of doing things, some of which I prefer. There are nevertheless ways of doing things. It's adaptable. I may have I may plan to do something a certain way. Circumstances dictate that it needs to become different. I'm 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 able to. To, to adapt and with that with that adaptability I'm able to tolerate it not being as I would like so whilst I may not agree with another another opinion or view or difference I am entirely comfortable in tolerating that that view is nonetheless valid to the person or the people who hold it and there are strong and I have strong preferences. And I want to I want to emphasize a particular point with strong preferences. When I've spoken to a lot of people around um, strong preferences, how they hear it is very much like a lowering of standards, i.e. it's not perfect. And I want to be completely clear about this. I, I am asking people to maintain their own standards. I am also asking people to treat their standards as one standard, not the only correct standard. That's why it's a strong preference. And the consequences of, of that as you can see in this in this graphic is that the mental filters change so instead of things being or must be perfect in every regard i'm striving for excellence and excellence can be defined in a given situation it's actually achievable perfection is not in so far as when people set out to achieve perfection, they, they, they achieve what they said they wanted, quickly followed by, yes, but it wasn't good enough, quick enough, fast enough, etc. So the goalpost keeps being moved. Instead of being strong, there's a degree of acceptance and tolerance. And, and the acceptance is of difference and tolerances of and recognizing there are different um, views and standards that other, others may have. There is also an acceptance in myself that as a person I'm fallible and that as much as I don't want to make a mistake, it is quite likely as a human being, I will make mistakes from time to time. And as much as I don't like it, I tolerate that it's being okay because it's an acceptance of me being human. Instead of the try harder and, 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 and so on, and every, everything, everything having the same level of effort, I can prioritize and manage my demands. So I can, I can calibrate 
the, for example, the effort I put in using the example I said before to giving a lesson to a, a beginner. I don't need to use, for example, all of my knowledge as a coach and my, and my coaching skills in order for a novice to feel challenged. I will, however, need to use a great deal more of all of my coaching resources to create a similar level challenge for that junior fencer go to junior World Cups so I can prioritize and manage. Patience is necessary. Some, some people find being patient very difficult. And, and if under pressure, there's are elements of hurry up as a filter, then the hurry up will challenge the patients. Sometimes things take a time that doesn't suit me. And I have, I, I have no control over that. So I need to accept and tolerate and then have some patience. And you can see how these drivers are, are not excuse me, they're, they're not discrete or separate. They, they can overlap and can helpfully or unhelpfully fuel each, each other. And, and the final filter in, in, in green is balanced needs. There are times as a, as, as, as a coach that I need to put the, the fences or the organization's needs ahead of mine. There are other times I need to put my need, be them my individual needs or be them the needs of my family and friends. I need to put those ahead of the organization or fences. So, so sometimes I need to, I, I can say yes to certain demands or requests for, for support or for coaching. At other times, I can equally legitimately say no to providing them. So balance needs. So, so implicit within balancing needs is a set of, of coping skills called assertiveness. I'm, I'm going to pause there, uh, Dusty, just to check in with, with where things are at. Uh, there's, there's still no questions at all uh, at the moment, but it would be good to hear if we are piquing some curiosity within you. So for those of you who are on the call, it'd be really cool if you could flex your curiosity muscle and uh, get curious about this, because this is very much focused about helping you and supporting you in your roles as coaches. Lovely. Thank you. OK. How, how many of you have heard the phrase control the controllables? Um, I, I hear it frequently. And it's, it is a genuinely helpful phrase in its intention. Making it even more helpful is how do I influence the controllables? And to influence the controllables, I kind of need to know what those controllables are and how to influence them. And here I'm, I'm going to look at specifically the, 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 the role of, 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 of self-talk in, in, in how we can utilize that. And this is the start of a slide that will, that will build up in stages. The situation and the perception are, are terms which have been summarized and taken from that overview slide that we spoke about at the beginning. So, so I'm going to be going into, into a deeper dive about, about those. I, I often hear people say to me, I, I, I don't know why I reacted to that situation the way I did. 
And part of being able to influence the controllables is to recognize that, to increase that awareness and then recognize how I can influence how I choose to respond in similar circumstances in the future. So it, with this situation, it's useful to understand what its context is. Often there may be a situation that a coach may react to in the way we described, and that may be an, another example of a series of similar kinds of interactions. An example would be there may be a particular stakeholder that you need to have interactions with on a weekly basis. And over time, you find the conversations quite challenging in an unhelpful way. Then you, you go into, say, an environment where you anticipate that person being present. And on the way there, you begin to think, oh, no, I wonder if they're going to be there. And if you're going to be there, there's going to be another example of this difficult conversation. So the the context or the history and the, chrono and the, and the sequencing of it can influence one why someone might react to something and also the intensity with which they may react to that in the in the middle of those th those three text boxes on the right of the screen there's the what happened these are the the the, the core facts I was, I was i was i was in the club and that person was there and we had a com we had a conversation about um my coaching behavior Th those are the facts they describe when and what and a brief objective con state of the content of what happened then there's what i tell myself about what happened and it was that person was so rude to me, each time I tried to say something, they kept being critical and talking over me and not letting me um, finish what I was saying, etc. So there's this whole internal narrative about what happened um, and the judgments, as you can see in the final text box, and the judgments that I make about the value of the conversation to me, how I felt about the behavior of the person, how I felt I was being treated, etc. So if you take the first part of the show, the slide situation and perception, it's deceptive. When we unpack perception a bit more, the critical element is the what I tell myself about what happened. And based on that, the conclusions or the judgments I make going forwards. That phrase, what I tell myself, is illustrative of my self-talk. The how I can influence it is where we is where we're going next. You you may recall I spoke about the emotional and behavioral consequences are consequent to my self-talk. And you can see that represented in a, in, in a more dynamic um, graphic at, at the bottom, the white text on, on a blue background. Once I'm aware of the content of my self-talk and the impact my self-talk is having, I can then understand why it is I feel the way I feel emotionally. How I feel physically, if for example, I'm aware there may be tension headaches or my jaw might be clenched, or if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling quite anxious, um, I might feel my heart racing, for example. 
And then as a consequence of the emotional feelings and the physical feelings, there's, there's what I do and say. And I wanted to add a detail to the what I do and say. Sometimes if I'm someone that's usually quite chatty, and I'm, I may become quiet, then the absence of being my normal chattiness is a change from my normal pattern, and that's noteworthy. And why I'm mentioning that is we really talk a bit later around using my knowledge of me and my knowledge of my preferred ways of doing things, preferred being habitual way of doing things, is important to help me cope. The, the key summary here is that the content of what I tell myself, my self-talk, influences the degree to which my thinking is helpful or unhelpful. Remember that being whether it's helping me achieve what I would prefer or moving me further away from where I would prefer to be. And, and, and finally, the, the um, intensity of the self-talk or the language that I use influences the quality of it. So I can feel a little bit put out, completely enraged, even though it may be externally the same situation or the same set of facts that I'm reacting to. So to help with that identification, I'm going to highlight um, several identified thinking errors. The formal term in the literature for those who are, have an interest is that, is that these are referred to as cognitive distortions. And I, I, I emphasize and remind folks, I'm talking here exclusively around situations that activate or trigger discomfort in me. So is that subset of, of experience? You can see on this slide, there's a, there's a, a longish list of, of terms which are, are examples of cognitive distortions or thinking errors. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, several of them by way of illustration. And if and if I miss one that you, that you want more information on, um, no, note it down in, in, in the text. And I'm sure we can we can have a, a brief conversation about that. The, f the first one I, I want to emphasize is the first one on the list, all or nothing thinking. It's sometimes referred to as black and white thinking. And it is, it is binary. It's completely right or wrong. So the, the structure of the thoughts with this thinking error is very much looking for the right solution avoiding the wrong thing, doing a good thing, not doing a bad thing. And another of the distortions I'm going to talk about is jumping to conclusions. As a coach, one, one of our roles is to be supportive of others and sometimes we can jump to a conclusion which is essentially some assumptions we make and those assumptions can be made or can be based on incomplete or indeed inaccurate information and once we've formed our conclusions we then assume them to be correct to the point that even if the other person says it's wrong we don't accept it so jumping to conclusions is, is an important thinking error 
because it has a significance in the quality of relationships in that it's the listening and understanding is not being utilized instead i'm viewing my conclusion as correct even if the other says that's not the case and that can that can exacerbate or make worse in some of those interpersonal interactions that we spoke about earlier emotional reasoning emotional reasoning is i feel something emotionally therefore that is how it is so if i feel something is threatening and anxiety provoking then it is threatening and anxiety provoking even though the facts of this of that circumstance do not support that emotional reasoning and I, and I want you to consider if as a coach you're feeling very strained or under pressure at, at certain moments and one's emotions are running high it could be that one's emotional reasoning might be inadvertently in a negative spiral helping us feel worse by reacting to our own emotions rather than understanding the actual situation or having a more balanced perspective. There are a couple of others I, I, I want to mention and then I'm going to pause for, for to see if there's any, any, any comments from folks. And, and that is absolute standards. Remember, one of the qualities of unhelpful thinking were, were absolute standards. These are often identified by people using the words should and must, ought to. So I should always do this. I must never do that are examples of absolute standards and an, and an interaction between an absolute standard kind of thought that is inflexible with an all or nothing thinking must always always implies this is right as, as the example and, and the last one I'm, I'm going to mention before pausing is personalizing this is where in the absence of good information if something is going wrong a person may blame themselves in the absence of having any other um, information or evidence to the contrary so rather than take the view of it feels a bit like it's me but actually i don't know enough to come to that conclusion is a, will have a very different consequence to well it must be me because i can't see any other any other reason for it so the, those two conclusions will diverge considerably in terms of the consequences so i'm going to pause there for any comments or feedback before we're moving on to the final part or the area there's uh, <clears> nothing <throat> come in uh, at the moment, Jonathan, but I'm, I, I guess I'm curious to think about this. If I think about my own coaching practice, what, and can you help, help me understand the impact that this has on my relationship or potentially has with my relationship with my athletes that I'm working with? So this, this notion of self-talk and thinking errors, what, what are the unintended consequences of, of, of this? The, the unintended consequences is that it undermines trust in, 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 the, in the coach athlete re relationship. On the receiving end, the athlete may well feel ignored, dismissed, um, criticized, um, not believed, uh, devalued, etc. And even though that may be the furthest thing from my intention, the consequence on the receiving end could be all of those and and then 
if you're coaching and you've got a close uh, relationship, sorry, a need to be under pressure where you're supporting each other or yes, yeah, supporting each other, the, the, the athlete through their, their performance, the coach through their coaching support of the athlete performance. If you then add pressure of the performance environment, if you then add demands from the, the governing body wanting certain documentation completed by certain deadlines, for example, um, those, those situational demands can serve as flashpoint triggers that will one highlight these errors first and exacerbate them further. So, so that in a, in a nutshell, Dusty, for me, is a set of consequences of this being persistently missed from the perspective of a coach. And, and I guess if I, if, I, if I just view through the lens of the organisational pressures then, and so clearly the intention of your NGB is to support the coach as best it can and still have a, a requirement to have governance and compliance and all the other challenges that it faces. I, I, I guess where, where I'm kind of stumbling around is, is how do I help the organisation to help me? What can I do with regards to self-talk and thinking areas, i.e., oh, I can't engage with NG, NGB because, or maybe that's not my place to say something. Have you got any thoughts around that at all? I, I, I think it's... It's challenging, and I'll, and I'll offer a more preferred or an ideal scenario. Sure. Um, and, and that is the recognition that, one, the organization isn't this thing. The organization is actually made up by a whole group of individuals working in several roles, trying to fulfill a set of tasks. So there, 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 there are actually people as opposed to this thing called British fencing or this thing called the FIE. They're actually people uh, and recognizing that first and foremost, we're both people and we're both fallible and, and we both genuinely have the interest of the sport at heart. We may have competing objectives mm -hmm. in, in that what what I want, what, I, what I'm needing to be doing in my coaching role, may be being inhibited by the, the demands being placed on me from the organisation. So, in recognising that, then that's called a that's placing me in what I call a role conflict. We described yeah. earlier. So, the first and foremost is I need to be aware of. Second, I need to accept it's happening rather than have, go off on one and say how terrible it is. However satisfying that may be in the short term, in medium to long term, it doesn't help resolve things. Mm. And, and mm. then it's actually making a request to the relevant identified person within the organization to actually say, yeah. there, there's this challenge I have as a direct consequence to the demand I'm, I'm getting. I would like to work away on, on either the how it's communicated, the timing of when it's done, or, or maybe can it be evolved in a different way so there can be a third option. It's neither the one you want or I want initially, but still achieves the respective goals. So, so here there is yeah. um, a need for assertive communication. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, it's interesting. And so when I, if I, although I may have taken a stand a little bit of a rabbit hole, I want to bring it back to the, the cognitive distortions and the self-thinking errors. Often we assume, often we assume, do we assume? I'm kind of think, speaking to think in a sense, but if I look at all or nothing, overgeneralizing, discounting the positive, if I, if I talk myself into or out of a situation before challenging an athlete or an organization, is, is, is this the cognitive distortions that yes. we're talking about here? Is it the, ah, uh, I think this is what's going to happen, so I won't do it, or oh, this this is going to happen if I do it this way? It, yes, in the short in in in, in, in the shortest yeah. term, yes, yeah. because 
I'm treating my conclusion as fact. And because it's fact, yeah. okay. it can't be changed because facts are immutable. Ra rather than <laughs> it's my it's my opinion, although very strongly held. So it doesn't mean it's the only one, mm. it's one of several. So the if I yeah. if I I phrase it this way, if I don't challenge these and stay stuck with them, I paint myself into a cognitive corner. Yeah, okay. I like, I like that as an example, and, and that, yeah, that's, that's it. Sorry, I won't, I won't go too far now. <laughs> I feel like I've, I've um, had an opportunity to explore that. Thank you, and I'm sure we'll talk about it sure. more offline as well. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you, Dusty. Okay. We're going to focus now on 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 the coping, and. One one of the the points I made before is in the control the controllables is it's identifying what can I influence within the controllables, and one set of resources that I can influence are my own coping resources, and that's why there's the focus on coping resources here. And there are there are many different kinds and specific examples of coping resources. I've, I've divided them into three broad areas, as in psychological. A lot of the conversation that uh, Dustin and I were talking about was very much, there was a psychological component to, to, to that. The behavioral component would have been the communication and the assertiveness. There's an emotional component, how I feel emotionally about something uh, or my emotions in general. And, and then there's a physical component. Um, an, an example of that in under, under pressure and demands is, is if somebody is feels they're under a degree of persistent strain or stress over time, they can start to feel physically ill. And one of the things that I've I've seen is a change in behavior where when before they would eat reasonably healthily, they if when they do eat, they tend not to eat as healthily as they might. Um, people who would normally use some um, exercise from as a, as a de-stressor stop to stop doing that. Uh, so, so oftentimes, in terms of the physical well-being, under under persistent strain or stress, people over time gradually give up the activities that usually help them. So, there are a couple of concepts that I want to mention. One is the content of these. So if I'm talking about some of the psychological resources, coping resources, do, do I know enough? Do I have enough knowledge and information? So, so there's, there's the content of that. And this, this, the second is, do I have enough quantity? Do I have enough of the, enough energy level? So if I'm feeling very strained and I'm as a result, physically exhausted, and I'm being asked then to go with the squad on a, on a three day camp, for example, and I start the camp already, already knackered, then the concern and worry about how will I manage over those three days becomes a drain. So that's an example where even if I know what to do, I don't have enough energy level to actually do it. And as I've spoken about previously, although I've, I've described these separately, these can overlap and, and, and interact with one another. We're going to now look at a specific uh, process of, of, of coping. And this is looking at the emotional and behavioral consequences more explicitly 
that was spoken about in in that graphic that overview graphic from from the beginning we're going to start here this 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 graphic is a metaphorical battery or the equivalent you'll see on on many devices it, it's it's a battery and it's and it's there because it is looking at the amount of resource I have at my disposal. And you can see, uh, take your choice, uh, a red, amber, green, or a green, amber, red um, rate, um, rating, if you like, to indicate when I feel I have sufficient resource or uh, sufficient of the resources I need to manage the demands I'm facing. If you recall that seesaw balancing graphic of uh, developing resilience. So that's what this represents. And you can see that you can see that elaborated on a little further more in the text boxes that are color coded against the red, amber, green. And, and there's a, a labeling for consistency of communication from thriving through managing to surviving or, or vice versa. And these are, and the importance of the language is one, it gives me consistency for myself. And secondly, if I share this with key people around me, it can provide a shared understanding. So if as a coach, I am, I am talking with, with the pupil, I, I can, I, and, I, and there is that trust in, in that relationship. I can say that I, I actually, there's a bit happening, you know, away from coaching. So although I'm good, I'm good for the for the coaching. Um, please bear with me if I'm not quite as as present as I might be, because I'm, I'm actually surviving in another another area. And in, indeed, fences can do the same. Um, the number of times I've I've coached people, so young people who are going through exams, um, I expect them to have less resource that's available to them for the lesson now because their resources are being, all, being utilized also for the exams and that exam period. And by way of starting that internal exploration to make that internal um, dialogue, that self-talk more conscious here are some starting questions that that people can ask and what i will say here is that i've i've heard many people ask themselves these questions what i don't hear is them answering the questions that they've asked themselves and the importance here is one, the asking of the question, but two, the answering of, of that question. And, and you can you can have a look through and, and, and use these and you can create and indeed I would encourage you to create your, your own that are particularly relevant to you individually in the circumstance that you are in. In in coping there are there are usually several stages and coping being coping as i view it being a process and one of the most important steps in that process is the first step and and i call this mood and well-being first aid it's what i do in in the moment that 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 things are problematic for me or feel problematic for me and you can see on this slide this the same graphic that we started on with a couple of adaptations um you can you can see the mood states thriving managing and surviving now are located in in the color coded areas and you can see a marker indicating a, a rating where you can rate where you are on 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 that well-being meter at this given point in time so
So the first aid has several steps to it, and, and this, these steps are important, and the sequence of the steps that are, are also important because each builds cumulatively on the next. The first is an awareness of my early warning signs. These could be emotional feelings. I'm feeling anxious. I'm, I'm feeling gen, 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 generally stressed. I'm feeling frustrated, etc. Uh, they could be quite a, a, a circular negative self-talk I become aware of. Awareness in of itself is not sufficient. I need to use the awareness to then recognize that I need to do something. And the something is to do something that I refer to as helpful distraction. It is something which is independent of the facts of what happened and my internal self-talk about those facts. So it's a neutral space, if you like. And, and, and it's centering. It, it's called many different things. I, I use something that I, is, that I term or is termed ratio breathing. And I'll give you an example of, of what that is. Ratio breathing is where you count in your inhalation for two seconds, mentally count in, and you count out for four seconds. There are, there are different variations of these, and it's more important that you use one of them, not necessarily this one. I will, however, emphasize the relevance or some of the important elements of ratio breathing. The counting on the breathing interrupts whatever thinking is going on. So, so it gives me something neutral to concentrate on other than my own internal negative thoughts and feelings and the situation. The counting is also a behavior to reinforce that. The reason why the breath out is slightly longer than the breath in is when there's increased emotional intensity, there's almost always increased body arousal. And therefore, what's important is to bring that arousal level down. And by breathing out for longer, what I'm doing is I'm encouraging the tension in the neck, the jaw, shoulders and the chest to loosen. And by having the body physiologically loosen, it can't also be tense at that same moment. So I'm bringing down the intensity of, of whatever the mood is. Then, and once I've brought it down and regained a little bit of influence, then I can begin to say, what are the resources, the coping resource, the resource or resources that I'm actually struggling with? Am I in a situation where I'm being asked to manage something that I don't have the knowledge to do well, to do well enough? Am I, am I emotionally drained? Am I physically exhausted? And I have more demand. Once I've become aware of that, I can then begin to clarify and focus on how to reinforce that coping resource or those coping resources based on the conclusions I've come to. Mood and well-being first aid. And the final part is, is going to spend a moment thinking about how to um, support thriving. And I've, I've selected this because if effective and healthy coaching, sorry, uh, help and healthy coping necessarily needs to include what I do well in terms of effective coping, how to reinforce that helpful coping and how to refine it to make it even more effective. And this is important because often people look at what they're doing wrong particularly through if they're using the lens of some of those thinking errors. And this is the direct um, redirection of, of the thinking 
into how how do I maintain a, a more of a thriving mood state? And you can see here the the, the well-being meter has been um, updated with a rating scale, and the rating scale is to add a little bit new, bit more nuance to to thriving, managing, surviving. In other words, I can be I can be thriving, good, or I can be thriving, absolutely fantastic. And indeed, there may even be some gradients between them. But but having a little bit of very of, of those gradients helps to support that continuum, that blue arrow we spoke about at the beginning around more helpful, healthy thinking. And on this slide, you, you, you can see some tips as to how to use it. The, the first is use it or equivalent. You can rate down your general mood and well-being. You can rate down, for example, your motivation your, your, your motive and, and your internal drive to coach. Um, you, you, can, you can be more specific in in, in different different parts of, of your working of your working portfolio. You can rate yourself on do you have the concentration and focus to meet the pressures and demands that we spoke about? And and that statement there for C is a is directly using that description of resilience, that seesaw description, and say, do I have the resources to meet the demands? And in order to do that, I need to know what the demands are, the pressures are, what are my current resources, and then how do they correlate? So although it sounds relatively straightforward, it's deceptive in the information it helps generate for self-awareness. Good practice suggests to record information consistently. And if you choose to use something like this as a way to get a sense of how is your mood progressing over time, and as we're approaching the autumn term and those involved in competition coaching, there is an event pretty much if not every most weekends between now and the middle of winter. And, and how and how is my mood and well-being now compared to the middle of October, compared to beginning of December, for example, when the when the experience feel may well feel different? And am I aware of that difference? And am I recalibrating my resources accordingly? And some of the support aspects of thriving and survive to, to, to restore thriving. Um, appreciate the trends of your mood and well-being, as we've spoken about. If there are any persistent survive or manage ratings that, that, that come up, listen to those, um, those messages and use them to direct action as early as you are able. Build in nurturing or thriving activities into your daily, weekly, monthly schedule. These are, please, these are not activities you do when you have spare time. These are central to health and to well-being. They need to be integral. And that can feel very challenging, particularly in the face of multiple demands externally and internal pressures to live up to certain kinds of expectations I may have of myself. And, and, and finally, appreciate the need for a work-life balance and, and incorporate in your schedule a blend of the social support or the contact you, you need and want from friends and families and maybe others. And if you're very much working around lots of people all the time, also consider what personal time do you need for your own personal recovery to counterbalance that.
moving forwards, we're looking to consider additional um, events to build on this. And all that's left for me to say is thank you for attending and and listening and hopefully have taken away some bits of information from today. Uh, and, and thank you very much, Jake. Uh, it's uh, very informative, very knowledgeable, obviously. And uh, thank you for sharing, in, in, our, in your case, just scratching the surface of the depth of knowledge that you have in this space. And I have no doubt in my mind that um, our coaches will be greatly benefiting from uh, attending and spending some time with you. Um, there are no further questions. And so with that, I will draw us to a close. But I'd like to thank uh, you all for coming along and um, spending some time with us and look forward to seeing you at other events throughout Learning Week. So that's it for now. And thank you very much.